Welcome, citizens, to Liberty Tales from the Tower. As your media director, it is my privilege to inform you that the following stories may contain content some listeners will certainly find disturbing. We here at AB3 are happy you have chosen to join us yet again. It can be lonely out there in Atrian streets, even on nights of the double full moons. So we are glad you choose us to fill your head on your long walk or sky rail ride home. Before we bring you tonight's tale, a quick update from the Division of Interactive Media. Greetings, citizens. The Division of Interactive Media is proud to announce new updates to our Liberty After role-playing system. Build your Atrian heroes, delve the dirty streets of the Fringe, fight the terrors of the Tales from the Tower, and make the Archon proud in our ever-growing game. Find Liberty After at LibertyEndures.com or DriveThroughRPG.com. Thank you, Aurelia. Now we have a delightful surprise for this broadcast. Tonight's tale was written by guest author Ben Thompson, the historian behind Badass of the Week. So, citizens, please relax, grab your drink, and try not to spill. <laughs> you may just need to call in the cleaning crew. After 20 years, I thought I'd seen it all. I was wrong. When education is compulsory, intellect and martial prowess are coveted, and everyone is pushing everyone around them down just to make a name for themselves, it's not always easy to find someone to do what I do. Citizens who aren't afraid to get their hands dirty, who keep their heads down, grind up their jobs, collect an honest living, doing what has to be done, and go on with their lives. Everyone these days just wants to be a Damn genius, a soldier, a broadcast persona, a scientific mastermind. Anything and everything to get a specialized mark. And make some kind of mark on this miserable world. If you want my opinion, <laughs> yeah, nobody asked. The problem these days is that geniuses don't always have the best judgment. With those guys, everything just needs to be smaller, better, more efficient. Those guys get sloppy. They make mistakes. Accidents happen, and when they do, they call us, the Engineering Division. I'm a maintenance worker in the Department of Research and Development. It's my job to make mistakes disappear. The job at a place we'll call the Arcus Tower wasn't my first Priority Zero site, but this one was difficult. Really difficult. Officially, it was dubbed an unsanctioned experiment that had gotten out of control and needed to be locked down, but my friend and dispatch said that some of the scientists were involved in some religious shit and started killing everyone and causing as much damage as possible. When we got there, the damp place looked like the inside of a fringe or brothel. The 40th floor lobby was caked with blood from floor to ceiling. In the labs, we found smashed equipment, shattered glass, and inside-out corpses strewn about like they'd been run through a spin cycle. Two giant steel tanks in the chem storage containment unit had been hit by something with enough force to leave giant dents. The director's office had a bunch of gibberish scrawled on one of the walls in someone's guts. Yeah, that sort of thing. And top it all off, there was a leak in one of the main drinking fountain's internal mechanisms. Those are a huge pain to fix. Now listen, you'll have a hard time finding a citizen in District 9 who's seen more fucked up shit than me. I'm not ashamed to admit that even I needed a minute to collect myself before I got to work on this job. Reef. When the new tech apprentice spent the first ten minutes out in the stairwell puking his guts out, not even Stolly had the heart to give him shit for it. But the Archon doesn't pay us to sit around and look pretty, and we had a job to do. The maniacs responsible for this nightmare had already been blacked out and hauled off to the Sub-6 by a special defense force team. We had about twelve hours to scrub the site clean and make all this stuff disappear. It was going to be one of those nights, non-stop work on a tight schedule, and when the Arcus Tower employees arrived on second shift, this place was going to be so damn clean you could eat your meal off the laboratory floor without giving it a second thought. I've got the best crew in Atreus. My team zipped into their biosuits and got the job done like professionals. The tech team disassembled and stripped equipment, prepping it to be either scrapped or shipped back to the DRD for analysis. My scrubbers dissolved or removed bodies, 
Ripped up ruined floor paneling, stripped paint, hung new panels, hauled away furniture, and bleached or burned out biohazardous materials. It was almost a thing of beauty. A dozen citizens working together to make the remains of what could be a badass slasher vid set look like the room that hospitals keep sleeping newborns in. And doing it all while the rest of the colony was off sleeping or partying. One of my favorite parts of this job is trying to picture the look on those assholes' faces after we've swept through their facilities during the night and transformed their workspaces from the stuff of horrific nightmares back into a pristine lab and office suite combo. When those DRD psychos leave work, they're doing fucked up experiments on Archon knows what in some freaky torture chamber. The next morning, they walk into the lobby and it looks like a new modular waiting room you'd see in any dentist's office. Brings a big fucking smile to my face every time. And that's what I was thinking about when this whole fucking job went sour. I'd been coordinating things in the lobby when I got a ping on my privacy hood by Bennett, who was leading the demo team up in one of the office suites upstairs. Of all my guys, she was the least likely to ask me for help, so I jumped to pretty quick. When I got off the elevator, I immediately felt that something wasn't right. Even though all I was breathing was the recycled O2 through my helmet's rebreather, it was still almost like you could smell trouble in the air. When I got to Bennett, she and Couture had stopped stripping carpet mid-roll, and even through their bio suits, you could tell from their body language that they'd been spooked by something. I switched my hood's radio over to a private comms channel with her and tried to sound as relaxed as possible. Now, I don't know if it was what she said, or the way she said it, but her answer made my guts run cold. Are you sure we're alone in here? Okay, now look. In our line of work, we do a lot of fucked up jobs in a lot of fucked up places. You see a lot of weird stuff when you clean up crime scenes, fringe attacks, scientific disasters, and after parties for a living. And it's normal for even seasoned vets like Bennett to get spooked from time to time. Fringe, if I'm being honest, I have to admit that this whole thing was making me a little unnerved. But panic is a contagious disease. It creeps its way into your mind, distracts you from what you're supposed to be doing, makes you sloppy. As foreman, it's my job to make sure that panic doesn't infect my crew and keeps us from getting our job done. Oh, don't get soft on me now, Bennett. Two CDF teams swept this place basement atop, and all they found were the crazies in charge of this mess. I'll do a walkthrough if that'll help, but you two need to get your heads back in and get back to work. We've been here 20 minutes, and we're already an hour behind schedule. I tried to act bored and annoyed as I headed past them into the office suites. Pretty sure I pulled it off. Most of the site was still running on emergency backup power because we hadn't brought in our lights yet. And I'll admit that late at night, some of those low light green and red bulbs can throw some pretty creepy shadows around a space like this. I flicked on my suit's built-in light and poked around a bit, searching for fringers, ghosts, or whatever Bennett thought she saw. Part of managing a team like this is being everyone's dad, peeking under the bed for monsters so they feel safe at night. It's something I like to think I have a talent at. But I'll admit, these offices would have been unsettling in the best of conditions. The place was trashed, and it was real clear that a lot of people had died in this room very recently. And here I was, with a head-mounted flashlight throwing weird shadows around an unfamiliar set of cubicles and offices, where every other wall was decorated in broken glass, shredded plastic board, and big, arcing blood spatter patterns. A couple of times I thought I saw movement out of the corner of my eye, a shadow shifting in an awkward direction on the edge of my vision. I just thought to myself, shit, now I'm seeing things. But you remember what I said about fear being contagious? It is. And I didn't have time to be afraid. It's my job to mitigate that contagion, not spread it. So, I didn't say anything. And now, I've got to live with that. I continued my sweep through the cubes, past the doors to the labs, and headed into the demolished ruins of the project director's office. There was all kinds of insanity scrawled on the walls in there. Math equations, non-atrian letters, some weird phrases that really didn't make any sense about an awakening or purging or some shit. All painted in blood and accented with occasional chunks of intestine or brain or who knows what else. It was... yeah, really unsettling. But nothing compared to what I saw when my light swept towards the back corner of the room. For a moment, 
it just seemed like the shadows themselves started moving from up above, maybe from a ceiling tile or air vent or something. I watched in shock as a horrific, gigantic black mass slumped out into the office and unfurled into a writhing mass of black coils. I have no idea where the fuck this thing came from, how the tax squad missed it, or even how to describe it. It was bigger than me, I, I, I think. It's such a dark shade of black, it was hard to tell where it ended and the shadows began. Just a rubbery, wet, amorphous ball of teeth and slime wriggling like a sea of undulating severed tongues in the beam of my headlight, and then flashing away so quickly that I wasn't even able to get a clear read on which direction it headed before it vanished into the darkness. Fuck. Now look. This wasn't my first Priority Zero sight, and I've done this shit long enough that my instincts kicked in almost immediately after the initial shock of seeing this thing pass. Standard operating procedure is to ping the emergency code on my hood, assemble my crew, and then hunker down and wait for the CDF tax squads to arrive. At this tower, mandatory response time was under 10 minutes, which, I'll tell you from experience, can be a lot longer than you'd think when you're trapped in a tower with an Archon fucking psycho or worse. I activated the emergency protocol to alert the big guns that we were in some deep shit, and a little red light blinked in my HUD to confirm that my message had been received. Even now, looking back on it, I don't know what else I could have done differently. I was up there on the 41st floor with my crew spread out across two floors of this massive building. I had no idea what could have been going on or where it was happening. All I knew was that I had to get my guys out of there, and I had to do it right fucking now. I flipped my comms channel open to talk to the entire team, but before I even got the chance to shout out a warning, I was greeted by an earful of fucking anarchy. Screams, swearing, and panic. From the sound of it, Bennett and Control were fighting with something, and the chatter on the comm was everything you don't want to hear from a group of people who put their faith in you to keep them alive. I hit the override on the team's channel, ordering everyone to fall back to the 40th floor lobby stairwell, evacuate if possible, hunker down, and hide if not. Meanwhile, I sprinted back through the offices towards Bennett and Couture, stumbling through the darkness across a floor littered by wreckage. They were more or less where I'd left them, but even though I was moving quickly, they were already nose deep in it. A few of the desks and cubicle walls in the room had been shattered to pieces and the black mass had Couture pinned to the floor and was flinging pieces of him around the room. His screams were muffled a bit by the airtight seal on my suit, but not enough that his final moments won't haunt my thoughts for the rest of my life. An arm and a chunk of his guts flung up in the air as this thing continued digging its way into him. Shit. I remember thinking, even if we survive this, we'll have to call in temps from another team to clean this up dumb thing to think about at a time like this, right? I broke into a sprint, but Bennett got there first. She picked herself up from among the wreckage of a smashed cabinet and rushed the creature with what was left of a steel broom handle. She speared it with the jagged end and drove the stick in there pretty solidly. The thing made a horrific noise, then wheeled and flung her like a rag doll into the side office nearby. Now look, I'm no soldier. I'm more of a glorified janitor than any covert ops defender of Atreus. But I sure as shit wasn't about to just sit around like a chump while some fucked up backgrown lab reject mutilated my team. I grabbed the first piece of gear I could get my hands on, a cordless nail gun, and charged towards Bennett, screaming like a maniac. I guess I can't say that the monster turned to face me because I still had no clue what the Archon's name I was looking at, but it definitely noticed me. It adjusted to my direction and surged forward with an unnerving speed. Acting only on reflex and instinct, I barely had enough time to ready my makeshift weapon, close my eyes, yell, and start pulling the trigger. It then hit me like a grab train, cracking my safety visor and slamming me to the ground hard enough to knock the air out of my lungs. I was pinned, stunned and hurting, but I just tried to focus on the recoil jolting my wrist as I fired nail after nail in the center mass of the monster. The thing shrieked horribly ripping at me with claws or tentacles or whatever the fuck it had, and even with my flashlight less than six inches from the creature's body, I still couldn't make out anything other than wet, slimy blackness, teeth, and whipping appendages. I could feel the warmth of blood filling my glove, but I gritted my teeth, ignored the burning pain in my chest and legs, shouted a few choice swear words, and kept pulling the trigger, driving an array of ten-centimeter nails into every part of it I could reach. A moment later, everything lit up with a flash of red and yellow. It felt an intense heat, and the thing let out one more collective wail from its hundreds of mouths before it was off and it skittered away into the darkness. Bennett reached out a hand to help me up, and her other hand 
was one of the acetylene torches we used to burn off latent organic residue. Apparently, she got it pretty well. We had no idea what the fuck that thing was, but at least it could burn. That was a relief, right? Bennett helped me up, and behind her I saw Stolly, Watanabe, and Flores running up the steps with tools and other improvised weapons in their hands. I guess most of my crew bolted and made their escape, but these guys had heard Couture on the comm and decided to come up to try and help him. They froze in shock when they saw what was left of the kids spread out across the floor and desks. A couple of them started to lose it. There was a lot of swearing. A lot of panic. I tried to check the radio, but I guess it must have been damaged in the fight, since my visor was already cracked up so much it was messing up my vision. I said, forget it, and just took off my helmet and its built-in privacy hood. A few of the other guys did as well. Okay, everyone stay calm. We have a situation here, and you should have evac'd when you had the chance, but now we need to... I stopped, mid-sentence, when Stolly raised her weapon. Who the fuck is that? I spun on my heel. Standing in the doorway of one of the offices behind me was the small silhouette of a figure. A girl. Maybe 14 years old, wearing torn, filthy clothes. Her arms and neck coated with a dark layer of caked-on dried blood. Her hair was matted down, wet with sweat, and looking like it hadn't been washed in days. Her eyes were frantic, terrified, and maybe almost a touch relieved. She was clutching her shoulder, and one of her arms was dangling loosely at her side. Please, save me. Nobody else is supposed to be here. The tech team swept these areas with heartbeat sensors, infrared radiation. Where the fuck did she come from? I looked at Bennett, who was staring open-mouthed back at me. Bennett was clearly trying to decide whether or not to turn the acetylene torch on the kid. Stolly was quick to point out that clearly the tech guys missed something, or we wouldn't be in the situation we were in right now. But after a bit of arguing, the kid shut everybody up by putting a finger to her lips. They can hear us. We can't stay here. <laughs> well, shit. Okay. I wasn't about to just wait around for my team to get eaten, and I needed to decide what to do next. So yeah, I know it's standard operating procedure to quarantine anything like this and report it to security immediately, but what were they going to do? We were blocks away from the nearest sky rail, two districts away from HQ, and 40 floors up locked in an office with a terrifying monster that already tried to take my face off once. Tax squads were inbound, but who knows when they'd get here, and even when they finally did arrive, they were already going to have their hands full. I had to make a call. I wasn't going to just leave this girl here to get pulled apart like a chore, and I didn't have time to sit around trying to think of a better solution. Okay, guys, we're getting the fuck out of here right now, and we're taking this little girl with us. No arguments. Follow me. So when I'm on a job site, especially at Priority Zero, I don't like surprises, even on blackout missions. When we have less than an hour to prep and deploy, I still make a point of studying the floor plans and knowing my job sites down to the studs, just in case. I might not have a decent long-term memory, but I can quickly memorize and forget all sorts of useless shit on a moment's notice. I knew that the only staircases down from our position that didn't involve a walk through the cramped lab rooms would take us straight through the main lobby, and that was the shortest and easiest way to get six people out of here. I made the call that we'd head down together, get out that main door, and seal it from the far side. If things went sour, we could bail into chem storage, which was the most secure room in the structure, and at least there we would be able to hunker down in a secure location and wait for help. It seemed like the only logical option given the data that I had at the time, and I stand by my decision. Gripping our makeshift weapons and scanning for danger, we began our long, terrifying walk back down the poorly lit stairs. Everything was oppressively quiet. Every step either of us took in our heavy steel-lined work boots reverberated through the room like a body hitting the ground. We had a few of the big directional orb-style lights running downstairs on generators so we could see what in the Archon's name we were doing, so visibility improved some as we descended. The lobby was huge and impressive. One of those open floor plan, tall ceiling, minimalist, creativity murdering office workspace deals with the big, imposing smart desk at the reception. Those fancy ergonomic chairs and huge steel logos designed by teams of DPA folks who were expressly looking to find the most intimidating branch insignia they could think of. 
The fact that we'd only cleaned a portion of the area made the whole thing that much more surreal. Almost half of the room looked like a fringer surgery room and the other half like it had just come off the modular factory lines less than an hour ago. And now we were going to have to cross through nearly 40 feet of this insanity, holding our breath and just waiting to get ambushed at some point along the way. I held our guys up at the bottom of the stairs and scanned for anything I could see. The room was quiet, except for the hum of the jetties, and the directional orbs were throwing curtains of white light across enough of the room that I could more or less see what was going on. The guys that had already bailed had followed protocol, which was to maglock the door behind themselves so the threat would be contained on sight. We were going to have to cross this entryway, get to the door, unlock it with my mark, and then spend an agonizing couple of seconds trying to get everyone through the door and lock it behind us without unleashing this monster on Atreus. We all took a collective deep breath and braced ourselves for the longest minute of our lives. I held up my hand to indicate that we were going to have to make our move and that we'd be going hard and fast on this one. As I scanned the faces of my team, they looked ready. Some clenched their teeth, others simply nodded. The little girl just stared at me, wide-eyed, shaking her head side to side. Couldn't tell if she was catatonic, in shock, or warning me, but I decided it was better not to think about it. I couldn't afford to lose my nerve. I just gripped my nail gun and stepped off the stairs onto the marble floor of the lobby. I don't really know how everything went down next, or even how it happened. But ultimately, we never had a chance. Maybe that thing had been waiting for us. Maybe it followed us down the stairs and decided it couldn't let us leave for some reason. Maybe it was moving through the ductwork. I don't know. All I know is that this massive, black, slimy, disgusting thing detached and dropped from the fucking ceiling without a sound, diving its full weight right onto Watanabe's shoulders and helmet and crushing him to the ground with a huge bang that echoed all throughout the lobby. And everything went insane from there. My guys were screaming, running, and fighting for their lives, but this thing was just so damn fast. Bennett pounced on it with her torch, but it flung her back across the room with a wave of one of its thick, rubbery arms, and the torch ended up landing into our midst and lighting Flores' suit on fire. He was screaming, and Stolly was trying to put him out, but the creature wasn't going to give anyone time to even fucking think. It pulled off one of Watanabe's arms with a single grab and wrench then slammed its full weight into Stolly and Flores, its form wobbling like one of those fancy artisan meals you'd see in the Central District. They hit the deck, covered in a dripping pile of thick slime and ooze. Stolly viciously stabbed at this thing with a fucking screwdriver while Flores rolled around to put out the flames. In the chaos, I lost sight of the damn thing as it melted into the darkness behind the big holodesk. Then, from the other side of the room, a flash of light caught my peripheral. I wheeled to see the girl pulling open the door of the chem containment facility. She was right. It was time for Plan Archon fucking B. We were never going to make it all the way across this lobby against that thing, and I couldn't run the risk of losing containment. I screamed at my men to fall back. I ran over and pulled Bennett up to her feet. But to my horror, I saw the girl was trying to get the door to chem storage closed. Was she going to lock us out? I don't know. I never will. But I couldn't risk it. Bennett and I both rushed the door and yelled for the others to follow. I got there before the girl could figure out the maglock and slammed my full weight against the heavy steel door, blasting it open and throwing the girl back. Bennett had also seen what had just happened and immediately got up in the girl's face, blocking her to keep her from doing any other shady shit. Words were exchanged, but my mind was obviously preoccupied. Watanabe was still completely motionless on the floor, very likely dead. I yelled and waved for Flores and Stolly to get their asses in gear. Both guys were pretty hurt. But they were dragging each other along and hustling the best they could, just not fast enough. Trailing a mass of slime behind it, this thing leapt over the desk and fell into them, digging its claws, teeth, its jagged arm things into Stolly's back. Flores slammed the thing pretty hard with a heat cutter, but it spun on him immediately and enveloped him with a whipping black mass of coils that bound his arms and muffled his screams. I told Bennett to hold the door and I bolted towards my men. I just, I just couldn't leave them there to get ripped apart. I was two or three steps away from Stolly, who was pretty torn up, but I grabbed her by her suit's harness and began dragging her towards the chem storage door. Flores, well, Flores was gone. 
and I don't want to get into it a whole lot more than that. The thing didn't start coming for me and Stolly until we were pretty much at the chem storage door, and Bennett got it shut and locked before the thing got close enough to grab us. Through the small, transparent steel window in the door, I caught another quick glance at the creature. I think I saw a big, unblinking black eye buried deep in the center mass of this thing. But maybe I imagined that. It moves so fast, it's hard to tell what you're looking at. All I knew was that we were safe, for now, and our Archon's specialized reconnaissance and engagement team was inbound. As soon as we were inside, Bennett went pretty hard at the little girl. You little shit! What the fuck were you thinking? Say that she was pretty pissed off us. was an understatement. You, you know what? I understand, but... Our blood would have been on your hands. Hey. Your Look, hands. For the rest people of do crazy life. things when they're scared out of their mind. And we don't know for sure that the kid was going to shut us out there with that thing either. I mean, if I was in her position, <laughs> I couldn't have been sure that the rest of us were even going to get out of that situation alive anyway, so shutting the door on us was honestly the smartest thing she could have done. But you Bennett like was pretty heated. Because if you try that shit again, so I, I sure as will. let her yell at the kid for a little bit I before will. I stepped in. Yeah, Perk. You're the boss. The kid went off in the corner to salt. So Bennett and I cracked open the lab's first aid kit and patched Stolly up the best we could. Stolly's spirits were pretty high for a woman who'd just been through all that. She was cracking a couple of half-hearted jokes, but you could also tell that she was pretty messed up by what she'd seen. We all were. I went over to talk to the girl, to see if she knew anything about this creature, or how we could fight it. Marie, even her name, just anything. She didn't really want to talk, though, and I added a lot of it up to trauma, so I didn't want to push it. Or maybe she really didn't know anything. Can't be sure. I mean, look, I don't have the ink to be a shrink or anything, and if the kid didn't want to talk to me about the terrifying monster she just watched kill two men, then I really wasn't of a mind to push her on the subject. Besides, it wasn't long before I heard Bennett whisper my name and call me out. I headed over to where she and Stolly were crouched, peering out the window in the door. I walked over to see what was up, and Stolly was pretty close to losing it. Burke, it's fucking Watanabe. His helmet mic is clicking. That thing is clicking the helmet mic! I carefully shined my flashlight out the main lobby, and there, in the center of the room, was Watanabe. He was strung up by a leg, his armless body dangling, and his helmet had been stripped off. He wasn't dead. He was dazed and messed up, and probably in shock, but he was clearly rolling his head from side to side like he was in a trance or something. I've seen that before with massive head injuries. Who knows why it's like that. I looked over at Stolly, who turned up the volume on her helmet's radio and held it out towards me. Something had turned on the radio and was holding down the all-team transmit button and was just rhythmically tapping on the mic. This thing was taunting us. I looked at Bennett and Stolly. Well, what's the call, Burke? He's still alive. We can't just leave him out there, can we? Not a chance. Watanabe is already a dead man. All we're going to do is join him if we take the bait. She was right, of course, but I'm a dummy. I'd lost two men already, and Watanabe was a nice enough kid. If we could get him some help, maybe he'd pull through this. Sure, his arm was lost, but that was nothing we couldn't fix with augmentations or prosthetics once the Special Defense Force got here, which was going to be any minute now. Stolly didn't see it that way. She was all worked up, whisper-yelling stuff like, We've got to get him out of there. What if that was you? All the while, all we're hearing is that rhythmic tapping on the mic. It's enough to make anyone insane. The girl came over and saw what was going on, and she didn't make the situation any better. You're just going to leave him out there? To be torn apart? Fuck no, we aren't! To everyone's horror, she climbed back to her feet, threw open the door, and ran out to get Watanabe. Bennett and I were so dumbstruck by the stupidity, or possibly bravery, of the whole thing, and we couldn't react quickly enough. We both started towards her to pull her back, but we never got the chance. Stolly got about two steps into the room when the main doors to the lobby blasted open with a couple of huge teeth-chattering explosions, followed in quick by multiple detonations of concussion grenades all throughout the room. 
The special defense force was here, and we didn't get their warning message because that fucking monster was holding down the transmission button. Were they really that intelligent, or was it just a coincidence? The explosions knocked me to the ground and threw my fuzzy double vision and the ringing in my ears. All I could see was not one, but two of those fucking things dropping down from the ceiling into the middle of the recon and engagement team. Watch out! The attack out. squad opened fire, spraying the room with bullets, and both Watanabe and Stolly were caught in the crossfire. Stolly went down, but I wasn't sure if she was shot or just ducked. And I haven't heard if either of them made it yet. It doesn't seem likely, but Stolly's a fighter. So I can still hope, right? I crawled my way back to the chem storage room, slammed that metal door shut, and locked it. Slowly staggered back to my feet and wheeled around to face Bennett, who was just struggling to stand as well, and in the dark emergency lighting of the chem storage room, I didn't even see the third monster come up behind her until it already drove two spikes through her midsection. I tried to bring up my nail gun, but this thing was faster. It drove a spike through my side, smashed me backwards, and dragged her off into the back of the room. The only benefit to being flashbanged was that I couldn't hear Bennett's screams as this thing tore her apart. I was still incredibly disoriented from the explosions, and when I hit the ground, I'd lost my nail gun somewhere. I looked across the room to see the young girl huddled down behind one of the cleaning carts we'd brought in to scrub the lab. I had to think quick. I scrambled up, raced over to the cart, and grabbed a big jug of sodium hydroxide. You know it as lye. It's incredibly corrosive, and we use it all the time to dissolve hair and skin particles and stuff. I wasn't wearing any of the protective gear for it, but I didn't have time to worry about that. I fumbled with a cap, desperately trying to open it with my fucked up arm and blurry vision, and, and uncorked it just in time to see a hideous black mass rushing towards me. I sprayed the jug of lye in an arc before me, causing the creature to make a truly horrific noise right before it crashed full speed into me. Our skins steamed and burned as both of us tumbled into the cleaning cart. The girl had already bolted, running to a back area of the chem storage room. She'd spotted a small window there, but it had a metal screen in front of it to block out sunlight. She began hitting buttons on the back panel, trying to find a way to raise the screen. The huge, heavy, writhing monster bored into me viciously, ripping up my sides and shoulder, but I just kept screaming and sloshing it with lime. I spilled a bunch of myself as well, of course, which is where I got these nasty burns on my arms and face. The pain from the burns is why I dropped the jug, but I still got that thing well enough that I was able to pull myself free from its clutches. I ran to the back of the lab just in time to hear the hydraulic whir of the metal shield slowly lifting from the back window. We were 40 stories up in the middle of the night, and it would have been a damn impressive view, but I sure as shit wasn't going to sit around to appreciate it. This was our only way out of here, and a little bit of sodium hydroxide wasn't going to keep that nightmare down for long. The girl grabbed off a broken pipe and tried to smash the glass out of the window while I seized a big length of cabling and tied a quick figure eight knot around the struts of one of the big cryo coolers. Thankfully, the window had been replaced in the last 800 years with one that wasn't military grade, probably because it was the 40th floor window, and we were able to smash through and toss the cable out of the window. Now, I'm not gonna lie, I took a moment to look down at our handiwork and smiled. Archon, I think I may have even given the girl a high five. Then I got fucking clobbered in the head by a giant mutant horror that definitely outweighed me. Teeth, claws, and limbs swirled around me, but it was pretty clear this thing was still hurting. It wasn't nearly as strong as it was before. Somehow, I kicked it off me, squirmed out from underneath it, and started crawling away. When I spotted something that filled my heart with joy. A giant tank labeled A-H-F. And hydrous hydrogen fluoride. It's the key component of most refrigerants, and it's basically just hydrochloric acid in gas form. This is how we were getting out of here. I yelled to the girl to climb down the cabling as I slowly crawled my way back towards the tank. Bloodied, battered, and broken in multiple places, I summoned my last reserves of strength and pulled myself closer to the tank. As I reached out to grab the edge of the tank's base, something wrapped itself around my leg and clamped down hard. I looked back, and this hideous, disgusting monster had dug one of its thick, wet tendrils into my ankle, giving off a disgusting odor as it began to dissolve my flesh with its touch. I grabbed for anything I could find, and it started dragging me back, pulling me towards the hideous maw of squirming death. For a moment, 
I saw this thing's big black eye again. It looked pissed. But I was more pissed. This fucking thing killed my team, it killed Bennett, and I wasn't going to be denied my vengeance. I hurled the only thing I had, a fucking meal canister, into this thing's big fucking eye and audibly chuckled when I saw it pulled back in shock and pain, moving to attack the meal. I'd like to think that maybe because it was a pumpkin-flavored meal it worked, and that the thing wouldn't have cared as much about a tofu or pork. Either way, my extremely pricey distraction was enough, and I was able to wrench my leg free from its grasp, drag myself up, and stumble to the tank. I disengaged all the emergency valves, cranked it all the way open, and recoiled in pain as the hiss of the valves began filling the room with colorless corrosive fumes. So, this obviously wasn't the most ideal of situations, but again, I stand by my decision regardless of the damage I caused. I got extensive burns on my back and could even feel the gases scratching up my throat and lungs, making me want to both puke and tear my own throat out. But I made it to the cable and dragged myself out of the window to fresh air. By the time I started my climb down, I could hear the thing wailing and howling in agony. It convulsed and retched like a million living tongues in a microwave. It was a truly horrific sound that I won't soon forget. Beyond it, through teary eyes, I could just barely make out the flashes of gunfire in the lobby. The girl and I slowly lowered ourselves down one floor, smashed in a window on 39, and re-entered the tower. The climb was short, but it was still pretty dicey with all of my injuries. This was perhaps the only time I could be thankful that I've worked in city beautification, and I'd washed enough exterior tower windows that I'm fairly comfortable in that kind of environment, so... I made do. From there, we found one of the back stairwells, took the long, painful walk down 39 flights of stairs, and emerged in one of the alleys out behind the tower. We hadn't spoken in what seemed like hours, but the girl and I had made it. We stood there, dazed in an alley behind the building, the only illumination coming from the additional lights being brought into the building by the soldiers. We could hear CDF running toward the tower, their radios broadcasting frantic reports from the combat zone. Everyone move in. I brushed the girl's hair out of her face and looked into her eyes, which almost appeared soft for the first time since I'd met her. You're safe now, I told her, in the friendliest voice I could muster. She said nothing. She just lowered her eyes and looked heartbroken, as a slender, black tendril whipped out from her back, arcing around her and drilling into my knee like a lightning bolt. My nervous system must have shut down my pain receptors almost immediately, because the only sensation I felt was surreal numbness as I crumpled broken to the asphalt. My eyes still locked on hers as she stared back at me in absolute horror. She pressed her palms to cheeks, wet with rain and tears covering her trembling lips. <laughs> I'm so sorry. We're not in control of it. We didn't volunteer for the program. We were prisoners, and those soldiers, they, they would have killed me if they found me. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. And with that, the girl turned and ran watched her tiny shadow disappear down the alley for as long as I could manage before everything slipped into blackness. Your men found me shortly afterwards and brought me straight here for medical. So, yeah, I confess that I willingly left a Priority Zero site, in dereliction of my duty, and failed to complete my mission objectives to contain the site and keep my team out of harm's way. And yes, I confess that I helped a hazardous creature escape containment. But I didn't know what she was. I couldn't have. I know you've got a huge mess on your hands here, and you're gonna need some poor bastard to blame it for. Fine. I'll be that guy. I'll take exile into the fringe, if it's gonna be like that. I mean, Reeve, after what I've seen, maybe exile would be a lateral move in my career. But look. You also should know that everything I've told you is true, no matter how insane it all sounds. 
I've spent 20 years cleaning up the messes of madmen and psychopaths who did fucked up shit. I've done my job. I've worked my ass off for the benefit of all. And if I'm going down because I felt compassion for another citizen... If you're not gonna exile me, we're done here. I've got a job to get back to after my damn rehab. Thank you for listening to the Liberty Podcast. If you would like early access to episodes and bonus content, join fellow citizens on our Fool and Scholar Patreon at patreon.com. This episode of Tales from the Tower was written by Ben Thompson, edited and produced by Travis Vengroff, and co-edited with sound design by Pacific S. Obadiah and Travis Vengroff. The character Livia Stolly was created by Morgan Humphreys. Cleaning Crew was read by Russell D. Moore, with additional voices by Kristen DiMercurio, Caitlin Buckley, and Christy Luce. This production is copyrighted 2019 by Fool and Scholar Productions, and Liberty is a trademark of Travis Van Groff. Thank you for listening. Hope that the Archon watches over you.